We want to welcome everyone to our 8.30 service this morning. Thank you for being here and being part of our service today. Uh, please remember that uh, we have one more week of the 8.30 service beginning July the 4th. Uh, we will be meeting at 9.30 and it will be one assembly at that time at 9.30 starting July the 4th. As we enter into our time together, let's start with a prayer. Our Father, thank you for all of the blessings that you give us each day. And Father, we pray that you will be with us as a congregation, that we can go out into the community and show the love of Jesus to those around us. Be with us as we enter into our worship service today. We pray that it will be acceptable in your sight. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Would you please turn your songbooks to number 509? 509. It'll be our first song. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ. thankful for the opportunity to come to the house to worship you we pray we do it in spirit and truth be with us as we go through this service this morning that we will conduct ourselves in a way that would be pleading to thee and do it in a pleading pleasant manner we brother ken as he delivers the message to us that he will uh, do the or say the things that will be uh be pleasing to you and be a benefit to us that we may uh, apply them to our lives and just uh, let our, our your light shine through us as we go out in the community. We pray that you will uh, be with us, all of us as we labor in that vineyard, that we will do the things that will uh, benefit you. We got so much to do here and so little time to do it we need to just dig in and and try to do what we can do to uh, further thy kingdom. Be with us now. Bless us and keep us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Number 944 will be our song of encouragement this morning. If you'd like to mark that in your book, go ahead at this time, but it will be on the screen, I'm pretty sure, I hope. Our next song is 523, 523. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's terrific to see you. Beautiful, sunny day. The heat's already up. Aren't you excited about that? Woo, gonna be another hot day in Mississippi. We're just so excited about that. That's us, isn't it? Well, maybe not quite like this, but we take what the Lord gives. Today, you know, is Father's Day, and I hope if you're a father today, you are enjoying the benefits of your fatherhood. The way you've given attention to your family, now they have an opportunity, a special day for you, to respond and build you up and encourage you. And if you are thinking of your father today, I hope that either you have the opportunity, they're living, you can give them a call and let them know how much you appreciate them and love them and what they do for you. And if you're just having memories of your father as I am, I hope that some of the great things that they taught you and put into you that you'll be able to reflect on that, especially today, and have some good memories. Maybe it is that you grew up actually without a physical father, but there was somebody in your life that filled that role. Today's a day for that too. And if none of that fits you, then we have our Heavenly Father, and it is to Him that we give all the honor, the glory, and the praise today. 
So thank you for being a part of our worship where we will exalt Him. We will be studying a portion of God's Word, and today we will be talking some about the faith of fathers. And I want to use that in order not only to encourage our fathers today to be the kind of father that God is expecting you to be, but also as we think about that, God is certainly the ultimate ideal of what a father is. So this gives us an opportunity to reflect on that and make changes if we need to. We're going to pray together, and as we do, we're going to ask God to bless us in this portion of our worship. And I hope that you'll take advantage of our time of study and meditation. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for the beautiful day that you've given us. We are aware of those who have suffered over the last couple of days as the result of the storm that came through the Gulf, and we're praying your blessings on those that have experienced damage or injury, and we pray for their recovery. We're thankful, Father, today that we can think especially about our fathers and how that, in a small way, our fathers exemplify in their lives what you represent to all of us. In fact, many of us, when, when we think of you, a lot of what we think bears upon the experience that we had with our earthly fathers. And so, Lord, I, I pray today that we'll have good memories of the influence of fathers in our lives. And I also pray that as we think about you and we think about the role of fatherhood, that our fathers will aspire to faithfulness to you. And in that faithfulness, that in fact, they will reflect much of the nature of your fatherhood. Thank you for the blessing of your son who makes our coming together today possible. And I pray that as we are assembled here for the purpose of worship, that we will accomplish just that, that any distracting thoughts will be eradicated from our minds so that we can give our hearts, our souls, our minds, all of our strength to the worship of you today. I pray that you will help me specifically to share, communicate in an understandable and useful way the things that you know that I've prepared. And then I pray for those who hear it that they, they can receive it in the way that will best benefit their walk with you. Thank you for all the blessings you'll give us in our worship of you today. In Jesus' name, amen. If, if you read through the Old Testament scriptures, you, can, you cannot miss the fact that the father held a unique role in the family. In fact, the position that he held was practically a position of royalty. He was considered to be the absolute head, the leader of that family. It's interesting when you look at how words are translated. One of the words that is often associated with the role of the leader of that family would, of course, be husband. I mean, he's married to a woman by which there was the produce of all of these children. And so he is a father because of his relationship to his wife. So as husband... That word husband actually carried with it in the ancient world the idea of lord, master, owner, possessor. My wife is not here in this assembly today, so I'm happy to share with you the fact that I love 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, reflection on this very idea. It tells us that Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, maybe you ask, Anita, you've been calling Ken Lord lately? You know, 
and obeying him, just prompt her a little bit. I'm pretty sure I know what the reaction is. I'll not share that with you right now, but you can experience that on your own. We are not typically inclined to refer to one another as my Lord or my master or my owner or my possessor. But I share that with you simply to understate the fact that here is a person that was highly respected and was considered to be, at least in a local sense, the authority. Now, much of what we see in the ancient world is actually something of what is reflected in the role of father today. Just as much in the ancient world, the father was a spiritual leader, so too is the father expected in our time under the New Testament system to be a spiritual leader. That's what our text here was expressing to us. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. That is the spiritual upbringing of the children. Just as it was then, so it is now. Father responsible for the bringing up of the children spiritually. In the Old Testament system, the father was also in charge of the socialization of his family. He saw to it that they did not put themselves in a position socially that would be destructive to them. And just as it was then, so it is too now. A father ought to oversee the social interactions of his children in particular. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33, corrupt communications, that is the result of corrupt relationships. A person needs to oversee their relationship with others. And in the home, the father is going to be responsible to seeing to it that his children are properly socialized, as it was then, so it is now. The same was also true with regard to the financial care, the material care of a man's family. In the ancient world, the leader of that family was responsible to see that his family was cared for in every physical way that was necessary. And the same is true today. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says that if man does not take care of his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, that, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? A person who, in the responsible position of father, as head over his family, if he doesn't take care of that family, if he doesn't see to their immediate needs. Now, it's not talking about always providing them with extravagancies. But it is emphasizing the fact that the father, just as he was in the past, so he is now responsible to see to the care, the needs of his family. And if he doesn't do that, especially those who are living right there with him, who are immediately under his care. If he doesn't do that, he is he's denying the faith. He's forgetting who he is. He's worse than an infidel or unbeliever. It's pretty clear to me that when you reveal, this, reveal the scriptures on this subject, you see that the Father especially, particularly, is going to be responsible not just to his family, but he's going to be responsible to God for the actions that he commits directed toward them. It seems to me that either a father is going to be responsible to the role and fulfill it that God has given him, or he's going to be a failure to his God. Now, I want to use an example that comes out of the scriptures. In fact, there are two examples, and I want to set them in contrast to one another. First, I want us to think together about maybe, maybe the greatest human father that ever lived. In fact, when we talk about him from the perspective of scripture, 
we refer to him as the father of the faithful. Now, I like that because it's not just the father of a great nation. That was the promise that was made to Abraham. But when we think of Abraham, almost always we describe him as the father of the faithful. And that has within it an insinuation already. If he's the father of the faithful, then there is something about him that contributed to those children that are his, that have become faithful. In other words, he must have lived a faithful life that then by his influence and instruction was transferred unto his own children. And in fact, the scripture describes that exactly. In the book of Genesis, chapter 18 and verse 19. Now this is God talking about Abraham himself. So if God is talking about Abraham, you know that this is, this is not something that someone had observed. This isn't just a reputation that he has gained. This is actually how God sees him. And God says, as pertains to Abraham, I know him. Now, the word know there literally means I, I, I trust him, I recognize him, I have confidence in him. He says, I know him. And here's what I know about him. I know that he gives commands to his children and to his household. And then in response to those commands that they keep the word or the law of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. And the Lord then concludes, because Abraham is that kind of man, then I am going to fulfill my promise to him. Wow. Now that's huge. God says, I know this guy. I'm going to set myself in covenant with this guy. I trust him. I trust him because I see the kind of man that he is. He is instilling in his children and in his household my will. And because he has that kind of mindset, I trust him implicitly, and I'm going to fulfill the promises that I've made to him. I think one great example of Abraham and his really micromanaging of his family is that instance in Genesis chapter 24, it's really the, the opening verses of that chapter, but Abraham sees to it that Isaac has a proper wife. Now, I don't know many fathers who have gone to that length to ensure that the future is bright for their family, but Abraham was so involved in his family's life overseeing, remember, them spiritually and socially, that he didn't leave anything to chance. He was active in participating in choosing the wife of his son to see to it that the future unfolded as God had promised. I just love that about Abraham. Now, don't get the idea that I have interjected myself in the choosing of my children's spouses. So far, I will say they have both done exceedingly well. I'm hoping that maybe the influence that I had on them as they were growing up instilled in them a decision-making process that resulted in the right kind of spouse. Nevertheless, Abraham, he was so involved with his family that he saw to it that Isaac married well. In the book of Hebrews, there is a reflection on Abraham again that insists on the faithfulness of Abraham. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 and following, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place which he would inherit as his country. And he went out of his own country not knowing where he was going. He dwelt in the land of promise as a stranger or a sojourner, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. God called him out of Ur of Chaldees into a place Abraham didn't even know. Abraham 
in faith and trust in God, took up his family, leading them to what ultimately would be greener pastures. He couldn't see it with his eyes. He didn't literally experience it as God would ultimately intend it, but he trusted God and God came through on his promises. Abraham is, man, he is a terrific example of a father who involved himself in the life of his family and saw to their needs. But there's another name and maybe one that you would not have immediately thought of. And that's because the guy that I'm about to mention to you is one of the famous characters of scripture, one that we revere because of the spiritual nature of his life. And that was a man by the name of Eli. Eli was one of those recognized as a judge and he was a great priest of the Lord. He had the confidence of all the people. He had directed them to spiritual greatness so far as that is humanly possible. So I can reflect on Eli and I can think, what a great guy. What a great example for anybody who wants to lead others in the right spiritual direction. So if he was a great spiritual leader, I might assume that that's just going to naturally flow into the relationship he has with his family. If he's a great leader of the people, surely he is a great father. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Oh, and those guys, just let me tell you, following in their footsteps, following in the footsteps of their father, you have it recorded right there, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 13, Oh, wait a minute. It doesn't say they were faithful like their father or that they were spiritually minded like their father. It says that they were vile. That is, they were filled with wickedness. They were anything but faithful. And this comment about Eli, and he did not restrain them. In other words, watch this now. He's a spiritual giant in his own time. People look up to Eli. Eli, we've got this spiritual problem. How can we resolve it? Eli's got an answer because he's going to speak for God. But when it came to his own children, somehow or other, he had neglected his own children. And instead of them just kind of getting by, and, and in some cases, I know, there are fathers who neglect their children, don't give them spiritual direction, but maybe the mother helps to encourage the children, brings them to church services, whatever, and they, despite their father, become spiritual people. And maybe the father later kind of tails along, and he becomes repentant, and he's also faithful. We say that's success. Not so with Eli. Eli began as a spiritual man, but he did not influence his sons, and they were vile. And not only that, Eli wouldn't speak to them about it. He wouldn't lift a finger against them. Just let them continue on their slippery slope of wickedness until it finally all came to a head. And in the very next chapter, chapter 4 and verse 11, we find out that things begin to unravel. Those boys died. They died in the tumult that resulted in the capture of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, two things. Imagine Eli, the spiritual leader of those people, so just connected with, with the spiritual things. And at the top of the list of spiritual things was that Ark of the Covenant representative of the very presence of God. It's been captured. Now, the ark is gone. His sons have died. And the Bible says, verses 17 and 18, that he was sitting on a stool on a seat and he fell over backward, broke his neck and died. Okay, so I got Abraham, father of the faithful, spiritual giant. I got Eli, spiritual giant, but neglectful of his children, dying in disgrace and failure. 
Now, I have one simple question for you. Why would anybody fail? Why would you fail? God wants our fathers to train up their children in the way they should go. And and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. God wants our fathers to to take the instruction of God and to instill it in the children. In the Old Testament scriptures, man, that that was at the root of the future of Israel. In fact, once the law had been delivered to the people, God then follows that up by saying, now you take that and you be certain that you teach them diligently to your children. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 7 and following. And we might ask the question, well, what does diligence mean? What would that look like? And he says, well, in order to teach them diligently to your children, you'll teach them to your children when they sit by the way, when they rise up, when they lie down, when they, when they walk by the way outside of the house, you're going to write that word on the doorposts of the gate and the lintel. They're going to be as, as frontless between their eyes, as signs on their hands. You're going to have the word of God before your children always. I'll never forget, and maybe you've had an experience like this. I'll never forget seeing my dad in his study. Now, he worked hard every day, but he always took time in the evening at a study, a little desk with a light, to spend time studying the Word of God. And then we would try to kind of avoid him because because if we walked by, he'd say, Now, Kenny, I want you... Yeah, he called me Kenny, so... There's that. But Kenny, I want you to memorize this little piece of scripture here. I didn't want to do that. That's painful, right? And so try to avoid. But all that instruction over all those years, here, do this or that. He did that with all of us boys. Where did he get that? Well, my dad was studious in the word of God because his father, my grandfather, was the same way. Many times when I would drive over to visit with my grandfather who worked on a farm, I would find him in later years asleep under the pin oak tree that was in his yard. I'd walk up to him and he'd be a little bit startled. But the thing I always saw was he had fallen asleep reading the word of God. The Bible was on his lap, open to some place that he had been studying. And I can only guess that that had been done by his father too. You see, the father trains the son. The son, when he becomes a father, trains his son. That's the idea. Teach that word of God diligently to the children. Why? Because that is our future. We're going to instill that word in those children so that they can instill that word in their children. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And, And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. What kind of instruction do you think that those children are supposed to obey their parents in? It is the instruction that those godly parents are giving, especially in regard to faithfulness to the Lord. Why would anybody choose to interrupt that process? Why would we be like Eli, feel ourselves spiritually, but neglect our children and our future? Surely we would not do that. And yet today, we are so enamored with distractions like ball games and extracurricular activities like fishing and and hunting. And somehow a father who wants to instill in his children the love of sports or the love of hunting and fishing, hey, peace, those are great pursuits. 
And no one would ever stand in the way of our children learning those things. However, to put those things ahead of the Lord, for instance, to substitute such an outing as that for assembly and worship of God, justifying it by saying something like, well, I'm taking them out into nature so that they can experience God that way. That is not what the scriptures are teaching us to do. We can do all of those things, but not to the exclusion of putting God first in our life. Why is it you think that teenagers come up, especially boys, I'm thinking, dad's not been a part or he has been very casually a part of the work of the church. When that kid becomes a teenager, they finally make their declaration of independence and they say, you know what, I, I'm not going to church today. I'm not going, I'm, I'm going to do some man things like dad does. Stay at home. You know, sleep late, read the paper, go fishing. Do something I want to do. Because after all, it's my day off. Do anything but what is the necessary thing, the spiritual thing to serve God. Why would, why would anybody choose to follow in the footsteps of Eli? Now, it's possible that a father... Uh, recognizing the mistakes that he has made, maybe will recognize that today and want to repent of it. And look, you should. But there's nothing that that repentance can do for the years of influence that have led a child down a wrong path. That's going to be the result of years and years of regret and lack of influence. And it's going to be very hard, even with repentance, to make those things right again. So if I'm a father, what are the kind of things that are characteristic of my fatherhood? Well, one thing is pretty evident, and this goes back to what was said about Abraham. Abraham was somebody that the Lord knew, but guess what? The Lord knew Abraham because Abraham knew the Lord. So if I'm going to be a faithful father, I am going to know the Lord. In the book of 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 specifically, there's actually, it's, it's like a poem. Maybe it was a song that the early church sang. But in that text, it is said twice. The, the statement is repeated exactly the same way. That I'm writing to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. You have known the Lord, Father, so I'm writing right to you. Hey, I get it. They were the spiritual leaders of that church community. Fathers, you know God. But I ask the question, how is it that we know God? You know, how, how can I get to the place that I know God? Well, all you have to do is back up a few verses to verse 3 of 1 John chapter 2, and you will see the answer to that question. By this we know Him that we keep his commandments. How is it that you instill in the future the knowledge of God and the faithfulness to God? It is by knowing God yourself. And the way you know God is by learning his will and then following his commands, no doubt about it. If you're going to be a father, you're going to be like those Old Testament fathers. You're going to be the patriarch. You're going to be the head of this family. In Ephesians chapter uh, five, you have the description of the relationship between the husband and the wife and the nucleus of that family. Verse 22, wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with a washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loved his, loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are all members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Father, you want to love your children? Then love their mother. Love their mother like Christ loved the church, willing even to die for her so that she could go on in purity. Be the head of the family. You say, that sounds great. You know, I want my wife. Just like you said, call me Lord, call me Master. You know what? All of those are a result of responsibility fulfilled. You want to be the head of your family? Then be the head of the family. You teach the Bible to your children. You read those scriptures before them. You lead the prayers at home. You bring the children to church. You be responsible for their spiritual development and you will do well. You also, if you're going to be a good father, you ought to be patient with your children because after all, they are children, little bitty humans. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, which is a parallel to our text this morning, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Don't provoke your children. Don't, don't stimulate them to anger or wrath or to bad behavior. Because if you do, you are going to overwhelm their heart or their spirit. Don't provoke them. Don't take the spirit out of them. Don't rail against them. Don't do unnecessary comparisons. Don't belittle them. Don't use negative concepts in relation to them. Build them up because you are preparing them for a next generation. And you know the influence that you have on your children is going to bear heavily on how they are going to treat their children. And however it is that you do, if you love them, they'll love their children more than you loved them. If you are railing against them, they'll treat their children worse than you treated them. Let's make sure that the trajectory of our families is always positive and upward rather than spiraling downward. The Bible also teaches us that we need to be active in the process of administering discipline. In the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 13, and verse 24, the father who withholds or does not use the rod, the scripture says, hates his child. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. The idea of discipline is the idea of training. I have got to be absolutely hands-on, absolutely involved in the training of my children. I have to see to it that they are growing. And remember those areas, I'm going to do it spiritually. I'm going to see to them socially. I'm going to care for them materially. I'm going to see to it that they progress naturally and well as long as they are under my oversight. I want to see to it that they make good decisions. And when they don't, I'm going to be like God is. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13 says that when God disciplines us, that's not something that we really want to experience. It's not pleasant. But he says what it does reap is righteousness. You are directing your children in discipline to the right way. And then, j just what our text said, we're going to bring them up. We're going to bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Training is a big subject. Maybe not even only spiritually. I want to be involved in every aspect of my children's life to see to it that they grow right. And so just as was the case with Eli and his children, maybe, maybe he taught them spiritual concepts, but he wasn't involved in the practical application of that. We need to do better than Eli. See to it that those lessons have been learned and results in a proper behavior. And then admonition is correcting or rebuking. When's necessary, we need to be unafraid and strong and holding the line on the truth with our children because they are, especially today, inundated with false notions of how this world really works. 
and what is expected of them by God. Look, if I am the kind of father that God wants me to be, then I'll be the kind of father that my children actually need. And the concept of fatherhood is based on what God is. God is loving, He is forgiving, He's long-suffering, and He is unfailing. Maybe that's the kind of father that you are. If so, you're reflecting the fatherhood of God. You're a faithful father like Abraham. If not, if you're not be giving attention to your children, don't follow in the footsteps of Eli. Don't neglect your children to their ultimate doom. Be certain that you involve yourself in their lives so that they can flourish as you were able to flourish. Maybe there's somebody today struggling with that very idea. Then today, let's pray together about it. Let us encourage you and be a support to you. Uh, Maybe you're not a child of God today. The best thing you could ever do for your children is to be a faithful child of God. So if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you're ready to repent, confess your faith, This morning you can be buried in water, have your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. You'll rise in newness of life. If there's anybody who needs to respond today for any reason, now's your opportunity. Why don't you come if you need to while we stand together and sing. What will you do with me? which we will have a Lord's Supper. Thank you. 
This part of the service, we gather around the Lord's table. If you haven't got your package for the Lord's Supper, raise your hand, somebody will assist you. Let us thank God for the loaf. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread that does represent the body of Christ. We pray, Father, that we'll partake of this in a way that it will be pleasing unto thee in Christ's name. Amen. Let us give thanks for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this cup. We just represent the blood that Christ shed on the cross. We also pray, Father, that we'll take this and wave me acceptable unto thee. In Christ's name, amen. We stood in Acts 27 with the early church partook of Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Also, at this time we lay by and store 1 Corinthians 16, 2. And if you study 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the two chapters of it, and we had the place at each table, you can uh, leave your contribution there. Let's thank God for all our blessings. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for living in a land where we can live and eat and continue and breed our family, Father. We thank you for this time to give back to Thee, and we pray, Father, that what is collected this day will be used to help people and spread Thy word throughout this region and the world. This right in Christ's name, Amen. Good morning. I've got just a couple announcements before Billy comes up. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was June 6, we had a K-6 cookout. We had 71 people here in the annex. We had little kids, big kids, grandparents, great-grandparents. It was an awesome night, but our plan was to go to the park, but it rained. So uh, next Sunday night, June 27th, we're going to meet up at the park and play after our five o'clock service that's the k through six uh anyone connected to a kid in k through six uh grades please come over to the park we're just asking the families to swing through a drive through and bring your own food uh that night and we'll get a pavilion and play for a couple of hours also next sunday morning uh, at 9.30, in between the services, uh, we're going to have a SALT Team 3 breakfast uh, in the annex. So if you come to the 8.30 service, you can uh, eat with us before you go home. Or if you come to the 10.30 service, get here at 9.30 and eat. Donuts and coffee will be provided. And uh, if you want to bring your favorite breakfast dish or casserole, of course, we will eat that as well as a time of fellowship. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'd like to join Tommy and Ken in welcoming you to the morning services of Boonville Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you back each and every opportunity you may have. Next order of worship will be this evening at 5 o'clock, and there's classes for all ages. We have a few announcements before we conclude our services this morning. The number in attendance this morning was 109. I'd like to call your attention uh, to the, which we don't have a bulletin, Jimmy's been out, but it's on the other bulletin last week, but about the uh, Fried Hardman uh, Associates Salad Luncheon. Uh, look forward to this every year. This will be Friday, June the 25th, so please make arrangements to come and join us for this salad celebration. Also, uh, beginning next Sunday, or beginning Sunday, July the 4th, 
uh, we will return to one Sunday morning worship assembly at 9.30. Dear church family, thank you so much for your prayers and concerns following my accident. Your phone calls, visits, food, and the many acts of kindness were greatly appreciated. This made my road to recovery much easier. Please continue to pray for me in Christian love, Patrilla Maddox. Trey, Jenny Carroll, your grandmother's my hero. She's so tough. So uh, these are all the announcements I have at this time. Please continue to remember in prayer all those that are in our bulletins, all those that have been mentioned here today. If you would, please stand for a closing prayer. Let us pray. Our most gracious and loving Father, we're so thankful to call you our Heavenly Father. Thank you for the privilege to assemble here this morning to hear such a great lesson, Father, we pray that we'll take this lesson, apply it to our lives, and be the best Christians that we can be. Father, we pray for all those who are sick, those hurting in ways maybe we know nothing about, Father. We know that you know their needs, and we just pray, Father, that you continue to watch over and be with those caregivers who are looking after them, and pray, Father, that you'll use us to help support them. Father, we just pray that you'll be with us through this week. We pray that we'll be found doing your will. We pray, Father, that one day we will be the heirs of your promises. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.